posterity. Extend. Remain standing while Inspector Greer lead us to the throne of grace in prayer. Let us pray. O Lord, our God, we beseech thee that it may please thee to bless the Federation of St. Christopher and Nevis, to give light to our people that are in darkness, to lead our Prime Minister, the Honorable Dr. Terence Joe, his cabinet, the high command, and the rank and file, including the civilian staff of our police force in the way of righteousness, and to unite all of us in the bonds of peace and love. We beseech you, dear Lord, to bless this very important meeting and to order all its doing to thy glory and the welfare, safety, and security of mankind, to establish our national life in righteousness, to make us relevant in the use of freedom, just in the exercise of power, and generous in the protection of weakness, to give and preserve to us good laws and righteous judges, magistrates, and police officers, who shall administer justice wisely in the fear of the Lord. We beseech you, dear Lord, to purify the commerce of our land, to save our people from indifference and self-indulgence, the greed of money and the pursuit of vanity, to prosper and bring to victory the fight against crime, lawlessness, and every form of evil, to implant in our hearts such love toward thee that we duly serve our fellow men, and fail not in our duty to the animal creation, to endure the thoughts and ideas that will be expressed today at this very important meeting with honesty, purity, reverence. Amen and amen. amen. Thank you very much, Inspector, for that fitting prayer. You may be seated. <laughs> Honorable Prime Minister, Dr. Terence Ju, Attorney General, Ms. Honorable Gaff Wilkin, Commissioner of Police, Mr. Hilroy Brandy, QPM, Mr. Osmond Petty, Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of National Security, Mr. MacArthur Brown, ACP's Mitchell and Adams, Director. Marshal, Mr. Clifford Govaya, Force Personnel Officer, Gazetted Officers, Ranks and File, a pleasant good morning to all. This morning I have the privilege of being your Master of Ceremony, and I would, I would at this time crave your indulgence in giving us your undivided attention, please. This morning we meet here, as is customary, whenever a new Prime Minister or new Minister of National Security is assigned, that such person would meet with the body to express thank you for your service and to outline their plans and policies for the police department. This morning, gathering is for just that. The Honorable Prime Minister has indicated 
that he wishes to see a professional body. And as such, at this meeting this morning, he would expect total professionalism. Specifically, steer clear of political statements, political comments, or anything that could be construed as political. We are here to serve the country, to serve the people, the government and the people, and as such should exhibit a high level of professionalism at all time and stay clear of the party politics. That is one of such policy that I happen to be aware of that the Prime Minister will expose to, expose to you this morning and I so thought I would just bring it to you so that we begin even before he comes to speak to us. My task is very simple, just to bid you welcome. And so I take this opportunity now to bid us all welcome to this meeting and invite you to pay attention and absorb all that is said here today. I would now begin the proceedings by inviting Superintendent Mills to lead us off in a session of worship so that we set off set a, a, a mood, the atmosphere, inviting God's presence. So, Superintendent Mills. Good morning, everyone. Can you stand with me for just a few minutes? Are we sure? Are we ready? <laughs> okay, we are here to worship the Lord this morning uh, for just a few minutes before going into the rest of this morning's proceedings. So we just start off with just a few songs, one or two songs, and I get out of the way. <clears throat> Until we are soaked in the latter rain. Raining all around me. I can feel it. It's a lot of rain. Right on, Jesus. Give us more rain. Until we are wet, until we are soaked, the light of rain. It is raining. It is raining. All around me. Just all around. I can feel. Just feel, just feel, feel the light of rain. Right on, Jesus. Give us more rain until we are wet and we are soaked. Till we are wet, wet, wet. Soak, soak, soak. 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 Wet, 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 soak, soak, soak. Wet, 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 soak, soak, soak. Wet, 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 soak, soak, soak. Soak, soak, soak. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Glory to God. It was not the one. He's all right. What you think about Jesus? Dying no might. Don't try to tell me that God is dead. He woke me up this morning. Don't try to tell me he's not alive. I spoke to him today. He opened up my blinded eyes and set my spirit free. All I want to know about is that man from Galilee. Tell me, tell me, think about Jesus. He's all right. What you think about Jesus? Dying no might. Don't try to tell me that God is dead. He woke me up this morning. Don't try to tell me he's not alive. I spoke to him today. He opened up my blinded eyes and set my spirit free. All I want to know about is a man from Galilee. Thank you very much. I turn over to the master of ceremonies. Thank you very much, Superintendent Mills. I think our spirits should be lifted just a little. <laughs> I would now invite the Commissioner of Police, Mr. Hilroy Brandy, to bring us brief remarks. Commissioner Brandy. Good morning to all. Honorable Prime Minister, permit me to adopt the protocol that has already been established by our chair. Thank you. So, first, let me say, on behalf of the rank and file of the Royal St. Christopher Nevis Police Force, congratulations on you, new Prime Minister, and the team, and a resounding victory at the polls. The people have spoken. Honorable Prime Minister and fellow colleagues, it is indeed a distinct privilege to be afforded this opportunity to extend a very warm welcome to all. I am particularly pleased to be afforded the opportunity to introduce our new Prime Minister and Minister of National Security, Honorable Dr. Terence Drew, to you, our hard-working men and women of the Royal St. Christopher Navy's Police Force. Welcome, Honorable Prime Minister. To start of a new government is always an exciting moment, in particular for the men and women of the Royal St. Christopher Navy's Police Force. I want to take a moment to publicly to thank you, the brave men and women of this noble organization for our hard work. Thank you. Thank you for your professionalism and your dedication to duty. You have done an excellent job in embracing our primary duties, which are to prevent and detect crime and the maintenance of law and order. As we embrace this new mandate, Please remember that every one of us must perform at the highest standard. At the end of the day, when the police are successful, then St. Kitts and Nevis becomes the ideal place to live, work, and do business. We, the members of the Royal St. Christopher and Nevis Police Force, pledge our support and cooperation and will gladly implement the priorities of the new government. Even as we implement the new priorities, please continue to recognize the power of the police to fulfill action and behavior and the ability to secure and maintain public respect. So Robert Peel. Let us therefore embrace our core values, leadership, respect, integrity, fairness, and accountability, even as we discharge our priorities to our new government. I want to thank you again, Honorable Prime Minister, to grace us with your presence as to wish you and your new government 
every success, and may God continue to bless you and your colleagues, and indeed, the entire Federation of St. Christopher Nevis. I thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner, for those remarks. I would now invite Superintendent Mills to introduce our speaker this morning. The Honorable Dr. Terence M. Drew is the fourth Prime Minister of the Twin Island Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis, following general elections on August 5, 2022, in which he led the St. Kitts Nevis Labour Party to secure an outright majority in Parliament, winning six of the 11 seats in the National Assembly. A medical doctor, Prime Minister Drew has provided health care as a general practitioner at the Joseph Nathaniel France General Hospital as well as via private practice in St. Kitts following his duties at Instituto Superior de Ciencias Medicas in Santa Clara in Cuba from 1998 and has specialized in internal medicine in St. Kitts following his studies at the Paul Foster School of Medicine in Texas 2010 to 2013. Dr. Drew is serving his first term as the elected member of parliament for the constituency of St. Christopher VIII. Prime Minister Drew also currently holds the portfolios of Minister of Finance, National Security, Immigration, Health, and Social Security. Prime Minister Drew serves as the lead head of government within CARICOM, bearing responsibility for health. Prime Minister Drew, up in the community of Upper Monkey Hill, grew up, I'm sorry, in the community of Upper Monkey Hill, located in the parish of St. Peter, and is the son of Ras Jersel Pet Mills, and Michael Mixtokes Heiliger. Prime Minister Drew founded the Care Foundation in February 2021, a non-profit, non-partisan organization that aims to provide assistance to citizens nationally across both islands of St. Kitts and Nevis. Prime Minister Drew is a diplomat of the American Board of Internal Medicine, ABIM. Ladies and gentlemen, can you stand with me? And as you help me, make welcome with a resounding round of applause the Prime Minister of St. Kitts and Nevis, Minister of National Security, Prime Minister Dr. Terence Drew. Good morning. One, two.
Good morning. I want to thank Officer Mills for such an introduction. Seems like you have known me for years. <laughs> you may have your seat. <clears throat> Let me recognize the Honorable A.G. Mr. Gart Wilkin, Chief of Police, Mr. Hilroy Brandy, PS of National Security, Mr. Petty, ACPs, Mitchell Adams, and Brown, Director of Forensics, Ms. Marshall, Ms. Marshall, good. Force Personal Officer, Mr. Govaya. Good. Gazetted officers, rank and file, and civilian staff, I want to take this opportunity to really thank you for welcoming me to speak to you this morning. Your work as police officers, all of us know, is not an easy task. But before I get into the meat of it, I ask the commissioner, a few questions. He probably was wondering why I'm asking him those questions. I asked him, basically, he's the chief of police. Who are the ACPs and the superintendents? I asked him, how much women is in that top brass of the police force? He said, one. And then I further asked him, how many officers do we have? And then I asked him how many women are in the police force. And I started to do a quick calculation in my own mind. And he probably wondered why I asked him those questions then. And you must agree with me that there's an under-representation of women in leadership of this force. And that is one of my first observations. So that is why I asked you those questions, Commissioner. I was doing my own calculation. But I greet you not solely as the Prime Minister of St. Kitts and Nevis or the Minister with, with the responsibility for national security, but more so as a citizen and resident of our beautiful country. I say that because I believe yours is one of the most noble and indispensable professions in service to our people and, of course, to our visitors as well. Give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> I speak to you now at this introductory occasion knowing some fundamental truths. One, that the first duty of a government is to protect its people. The peace and prosperity we yearn for requires a resolute foundation of law and order. The police service is in the vanguard of law and order. Leadership and management at all levels must be sound, responsive, effective, and efficient. Of course, we would have heard complaints about police officers, but I will always contend that the majority, majority of officers are hard working, goodwill, and carry out their duties with respect and the professionalism that is expected. Nonetheless, all of us must agree that there's always room for improvement. The elections of August 5th are now behind us. Our people have spoken, as Superintendent Mills would have said. St. Kitts and Nevis is now under new political leadership. If we are truly honest with ourselves, we know that politics is sewn into the fabric of every part of our society, whether we like it 
or not. It's a reality. However, I am not concerned about the politics at this moment, or solely, let me put it that way. I am not concerned if you supported my party in the re recent elections or not. Those are not my priorities, although important. I am concerned that our police force is professional, courteous, courageous, compassionate, devoted, well-equipped, and dedicating to protecting and serving all of our people with distinction and integrity. Going forward, therefore, your government understands that the societal peace and stability are vital to achieving our progressive agenda. But first and foremost, there must be due attention to justice, natural justice, social justice, economic justice, environmental justice, and workplace justice. Accordingly, the strength of the police service is, type, is top priority. But what does this mean? It means that our people must see, hear, and feel your presence in a constructive manner. For example, it is your government's position that patrolling is the essence of community pol policing. Yes, police stations have their roles, but nothing beats direct and dynamic engagement with the people, all groups, all walks of life. But we are committed to make sure that the police, you who serve, are comfortable. We are blessed to live in a country where soldiers are not always in the streets to keep the peace or where tanks roll through our community or communities to keep order. No, indeed, we live in a country governed by the rule of law. I will say that again. No, indeed, we live in a community, a country governed by the rule of law. As your police force mission states, the purpose of the Royal St. Christopher Nevis Police Force is to uphold the law fairly and firmly without fear, without fear, that's powerful, that's powerful. I know that the maintenance of law is hard, stressful, and tiring. Therefore, I pledge as your Minister of National Security to do all I can to ensure that you receive decent wages relative to your work. <laughs> that you are adequately resourced to act on and respond to genuine needs at moment's notice. And that equal opportunities for improvement and advancement are extended to all. Residents and visitors pay taxes and fees they have high expectations. They deserve excellent services. You deserve optimal support. I commit to working assiduously to achieve both ends simultaneously, for the police cannot be expected to do much with little. Our people know that the overwhelming majority of police officers do an extremely difficult and dangerous job fairly and professionally. We must admit that. You are deserving of our respect and not our scorn. You are deserving of our cooperation and not our hostility. You are deserving of our gratitude and not our condemnation. Therefore, during my term, I ask you to join me and to support me on this quest to ensure that you receive the respect, cooperation, gratitude that you deserve in this noble profession. In due course, I will make announcements about improvements in essential functions and structures, including conditions of work. But first, as minister, I must take advice about the general situation and trends. Therefore, alongside my cabinet, I will be engaging with the top ministry officials and your high command. My friends, None of us is immune to mistakes and missteps. I know I will make my share as a human, 
But I navigate the uncharted waters of governance on our ship of state. However, it is my goal and I ask that it be yours as well to use our mistakes and missteps as opportunities, opportunities for improvement in all that we do. Like most kitchens and divisions, you wake up every day. Hopefully ensure, hopefully ensure you eat a good breakfast, say goodbye to your loved ones, and head off to your post. But your work is not like the majority of ours. Most, most of us do not have to answer a call that involves rushing to a traffic accident at 3 a.m. or a domestic dispute or even a murder scene. Most of us are not put in harm's way when we carry out our work duties. As your minister and a fellow resident of this beloved country, I sincerely appreciate your service and I want all of our people to feel the same. And you may not hear it enough, but I want to take this opportunity to say thank you. Thank you for your commitment to serve. Thank you for protecting all of us. Thank you. I sincerely look forward to engaging all of you in the coming months and years so that we can share ideas and discuss ways and means of improving policing here in our Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. And I want to say thank you once again for agreeing to be police officers and to be public servants. With your help, I know we will transform St. Christopher and Nevis Police Force into a paragon of excellence and the envy of police forces throughout the region. That is my goal, and I hope it is yours as well. And I want to finally say to all of you that as we endeavor to work together to improve where we can and to satisfy the many needs that, needs that need to be satisfied so that you can carry out your work efficiently and effectively, I want to thank you for your attention and may God bless all of you. Thank you for these moments. Okay, we want to thank the Honorable Prime Minister for these words of wisdom. I must indicate to you, however, that he will not entertain questions at this time. I'm just now told that he would entertain a few. So the man who he is, he cannot just come here and not hear from you. So I would uh, invite persons from the floor, anyone from the floor who may wish to ask a question, to kindly stand and state your name, rank, and proceed with your question or comment. Do we have an extra mic that we could share? There's a mic at the back, Mr. Marisha. <laughs> if we have anyone who wish to speak, there's a mic that is being passed at the back. Okay, Mr. Maguire is on his feet. Could we have... Mr. Marshall, do we have an extra mic for the head table? Number 47, Sergeant Matthew Maguire. So, um, let me personally extend congrats. congratulations to your victory and also to the Honorable Attorney General, Mr. Gad Wilkins, for um, taking the lead in the, um, the responsibility with regards to the police force. And so, so I want to raise three concerns. One has to do with um, training and development, and the other has to do with crime prevention, and the third has to do with more or less of welfare issue. And so if I will start with the, the um, 
a lot of us. Um, I am very pleased that you are open to suggestions and ideas and you have put out front the concept, the, an understanding and compassionate way as to the challenges of the police force and you're willing to address the issues that um, come with that. However so, um, some of the things that I want to highlight, it has to do with um, the benefits of police officers having served for a period of time and with that benefit it also includes in relation to police officers dying in line of service and the beneficiary that pass on to their, their, their spouses and these are to my mind, within the regulation, the police act so um, needs to be looked at seriously with a view of improvement. And so I hope that part of this engagement will be something that will be ongoing with the Police Welfare Association. In the area of training and development, so I I am um, one of the things that I think should be considered um, seriously is training that is available for police officers that can ascend them in relation to the leadership the leadership training and not only the that aspect of it it should be system should be put in place that will um, be done in a interview for example um i don't recall that um um, police officers have been given a scholarship to like do courses overseas and so you would have seen that happen in the civil in other areas of the civil service and so I think that is something that can be um, explored seriously and if there is opportunity that um, it should be given in a way for develop the overall development of police officers in relation to the, the, the force personnel officer, I think that the, the office there, improvement that can, can be done in relation to the force personnel officer. <coughs> in my personal opinion, I think it's not fully meeting the needs as an office. For example, if there are concerns, I don't think that your concerns are being adequately addressed. When you do promotion, for example, I, I even examine your concern, there have not been any proper way of giving you the kind of satisfaction that you need. Like, for example, if you're falling short in an area, you should be guided along and so that with the view of improvement. And that has been a very serious area of concern for police officers um, in, in the police force. My final point in relation to crime prevention so as the sergeant in charge of the Old Road Policing District, I have in initiated um, an initiative called the Advisory Group and, and the District Advisory Group and Crime Prevention and, and Community Policing. What I've sought to do with that is that I have identified stakeholders within every area of the, the policing district and from time to time because I believe that the police must be able to solicit the partnership of the entire community and so far we have been having that organization going during my time at Dolores Police Station. What I'm asking because I recognize that in relation to crime prevention that they have been a very quiet period. And so I'm asking, I know that you would have indicated that the peace program will be reviewed. And so I'm asking that that can be part of how it can be integrated into that effort so that you can have the full, a holistic approach in relation to the community participation in crime prevention. I'll be available and, and be open to any kind of um, suggestion in that regard. Thank you so much.
भाई सर माइक माइक इज ऑफ ओके कुछ ब्रिंग दैट वन ब्रिंग दैट वन दैट इज ओके Right, I think it's being carried live, and it's not an opportunity for them to focus on me there um, very much. But I want to thank uh, Sergeant Maguire for his initiative, and these are the type of innovative um, initiatives that we need. This is what you call leadership. Leadership means that you take the initiative, and you don't always have to wait on your superiors to give you a direction. However, I would like to say that when you take an initiative. and that initiative is seen as a good initiative that you should be encouraged also from the top to help that initiative to go forward so you really should be the support that you should get at the the local level or the ground level to make sure that your initiative is going forward i would like to say with respect to the and you talk about the compensation and and benefits and you spoke specifically to the area of police who die in the line of duty i would think that even before you become a police officer that that has to be one of the condition that you put that the government must put forward that any officer who die in the line of duty this will be the compensation without question i can't imagine that you are in a profession where thank god we have not had much of those instances but you are in the line where that can occur and that has to be one of the conditions of your employment and i want that to be immediately be looked at immediately be looked at and if there are any outstanding issues with respect to that i will also ask that that be looked at and therefore i want to assure you Sergeant Maguire and you spoke of the welfare commission I hope to meet with that commission as quickly as possible as well initially when I said that we may not entertain question is because I wanted to meet with the commission to get an idea of what the issues are facing the police officers I want to hear it from you because you represent the wider body so that I will be able to start dealing with a number of them almost immediately because this one that you spoke about the compensation for officers who die in the line of duty that is something that i want to be fixed and be fixed very very quickly and for those who would have lost their lives in duty i want that also to be sorted out if there are any um, to be sorted out very quickly all right with respect to scholarships i'm told that there are number of police officers on study leave but i will say something here that our society is quickly becoming uh, is 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 well educated is a well educated society you would admit for example years ago if you go to high school and you got a couple of sexy subjects you were on top of the world now sexy subjects have become a norm and that is why one of the first measures i've taken is to make the college free and the reason why i've made the college free is that we must recognize that high school does not cut it any longer in terms of if you are tra um, traveling an academic path but we need our people to be also college educated and there should be no barriers and so i want to look at opportunities that you like anybody else in society would have or organizations would have to be able to be trained at a higher level 
because what we'll recognize is that the force is going to get people applying to the force with 10 and 12 subjects, college degrees. We have to be able to create space for our people who are advancing, and we expect our police officers to also advance with the academic trend among our people here in St. Kitts and Nevis. And so we must look at that. Look at that. And one of the policies we put in place, and we had that policy before, is that no matter where you are found, as long as you have a degree from an accredited school, you will be paid for your degree. That will be a policy that will introduce why. Why is it someone should go away, spend all money, time, become educated, and don't we want more educated in every aspect of our society? So you must be compensated to, for it. So if there's any of you among the police rank who have a degree and is not being paid for your degree, you will be paid for your degree. So it would be worth getting a degree. Because I have come to the conclusion, my team have come to the conclusion, that, that if we don't get our population up to 25% educated at very high levels, we will not be able to compete effectively in this advancing world. And so those type of policy decisions, policy decisions are the decisions that we will make, policy decisions of incentives to incentivize our people to push hard, to study more, to become more professional, to dedicate themselves more. There must be something in that for you as well. All right? And also, with respect to that, the welfare, I don't know, one of our policy measures would be the honorarium. I know a lot of you work on the front line. I don't know if you have gotten anything. Have you gotten? No. <laughs> well, I'm sure this is a welfare issue, um, Sergeant Maguire. Is that so? So I'll have to get it from the heads to, to confirm what you have said. That's true. All right, so the chief of police has confirmed that you have not gotten anything. And so <laughs> we have promised that we will look at a benefit or an honorarium, the word explains it, that you would have really been on the front line. When COVID was hitting, you didn't know if you would die or not. You didn't know if you will carry it home to your children and your parents and die, and you did it in good faith. And my position is, and it has been, if you remember what I said, that people dedicate themselves, risk their lives, but we must also show some sort of appreciation, not just by words, but it should be tangible. Yes. And if, and I would say that if those on the top would have received Right, and no hard feelings to them. If they dedicate themselves, they deserve what they get. But you too should also get. All right, and so we'll quickly look, look at that um, as well. And the scholarships, I will get the information, um, the official information as to how that functions. And again, our policy direction is to get you all as educated as possible are uh, trained or uh, better trained as all of us. Even in medicine, every year I have to be studying, studying, studying. It never stops so that I don't drop behind and that I can keep abreast. And I think it should be the same for policing as well. All right. Okay, good. So um, the compensation benefits, uh, we talk about the, uh, talk about your program and the scholarships issue. And we discuss something I think your commission would be, would be happy about. And that would be that you will we will work on getting you um, some benefit for your dedication um, to dealing with the COVID situation, especially when you give your service not knowing if you will be dead or your children will be dead. That is noble, and there should be tangible, tangible benefits as a result. Okay? Thank you, Prime Minister. We have other persons on the floor who have indicated. Yeah, yeah. You have a mic. Oh, so we use the same. 
you have something to say? You have something to say? You want to make a statement, Mr.
All right, I want to thank the two officers for their questions. So I'll go from top to bottom. One was asked about the EMS training, and I think, and you are right, that's a very good question. I would ask a question, is, is basic life support a part of the police training? Basic life support can, I'm a doctor, I, I teach it. First aid is taught, and basic life support. All right, good. So, um, as was mentioned, that is normally a part, and it should be a part. Police officers are supposed to know, you are first responders, you are supposed to know at least how to clear an airway and to resuscitate the heart if possible. You're supposed to be able to give basic life support. You're supposed to be able to at least stabilize a wound, know to position people at least until the EMS gets there. As you said, and it goes as far as sometimes the police officers should know, um, in some jurisdiction, maybe not here, if you meet a lady delivering, how to at least take the head out. But I say that, <laughs> I say that because as a first responder, that is expected of you, and I'm glad that it was said that this is actually part of it. I don't think a person should be passed out as a police officer without knowing basic life support. Basic life support, you don't even have to know how to read or write to learn it. And it is learning basically one or two hours. So it's not any extra time you have to spend. But believe me, the very life you save might be your family life, your family member's life, or your partner's. All right? So that should be part of it. And it doesn't cost anything extra. It's just an hour or two. And you, you'll be surprised how much you learn in that hour or two to resuscitate somebody who might have fainted in front of you. And you could do something to really save their lives. So that should, from my estimation, should be seriously looked at and be included. And if you think it's not part of the formal course, then it should be offered to police officers, and they should be given the opportunity to recertify from time to time. So when it comes to, I think you talk about training, these are the other things that um, actually need to be um, looked at as well. So um, I agree with you that that should be part of it. I'm happy that at least first aid used to be given, but um, and basic life support can be taught and easily learned because you don't even need to know to be a scholar to do that. Just to say it's very simple, straightforward, but can save lives. All right, with respect to money management, and that is why I would like to talk to the police um, welfare, because these are the kind of things that you can bring to them and say, look, we need a course of police, of, of, of money management, because we think that officers may be affected by mishandling their money, if that is an issue, but it should at least be offered. And the second thing that you, you mentioned is the access to psychologists. This one I, I agree with you with. I am hoping that you have a process in the police force of debriefing and helping people to go through the trauma, otherwise you'll suffer from... Right. Well, that is something that has to be looked at because you might be suffering from PTSD, post-traumatic stress, or low levels of anxiety or depression based on your job, and you should be able to have some service that can help you to deal um, with these issues, of course. Very confidential, very private, but they should be um, services for you. Why? Because your very job is, an anxious, is a job that creates anxiety. A very job you deal with crimes. I mean, if you go to a crime scene, you don't play tough and that you can't be affected psychologically. You're a human being as well. And that would have an impact on you and you should be given the opportunity to effectively and professionally debrief so that you don't have long-lasting um, psychological effects which can manifest itself in many different ways, including your behavior and affect your life, your family's life, and even your function in the, 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 um, the police force. So that is why I will say to the police commission, um, well, the, the welfare commission, is that these are things that can also be looked at to make sure that you are taken care of as a whole human being, right? Once to talk about welfare, one of the things that concerned me when we spoke about, I am still wondering in my head, what are the factors? I know that women in society, when it comes to their level of education and their competency, they are very, the levels are very high. 
but it's not being reflected in the police force. And I'm asking myself as I'm sitting there, are there barriers in the police force that's affecting women from ascending? And those also need to be looked at. Because I want a report on how much women here, the percentage you make up, where are you in the strata of the whole direction of the police force in terms of leadership. And it seems to me, from what I'm picking up, I ask him, I did a quick calculation, that you have a very small point, and I'm sure as I come down, you're going to spread out very wide here. That means that there might be barriers for opportunity to, for, for women to move up. That might be one. I'm not saying it so. I'm just looking at numbers and trends by asking him the questions that he probably was wondering why doctors were asking me these elementary questions. But the other thing is, I'm hoping that these barriers are not such that women do not see policing as a noble profession that they can enter in and have the opportunity to be professionals and serve their country. I am not saying I have all the numbers. I am looking, I have all the answers to that. I am looking at the numbers and I will seek to find out what the answers are. With respect to those who from overseas who are here, I um, will also want to find out what was the recruitment um, strategy, what were the promises uh, made, have they, been, have, they been, have they been kept or not? Um, so I will quickly look at um, what, was, what was promised and what you were denied once you got on the ground. And then the other thing I was speaking to the AG with respect to the law of 14 years. And I am aware that there's a law for, that has been there since independence um, that it would be 14 years. I don't know if you were promised something else as part of your recruitment package that you would have been um, presented with before you made the decision to come here. So we'll also take a look at that. So I would have those be placed before me so that we can make the necessary decisions um, to make sure that we um, deal with you fairly um, as such. All right, so I think I would have answered those questions um, that would have been asked um, would have been asked of me. There's another one that I needed to answer from Sergeant Maguire. When he spoke about you do an exam and you don't get a proper feedback, I think that that should really be looked at. Exams are not just to see how much you know or don't know, but exam measure where you are and exams serve as a guiding light as to where you need to be. And therefore, you should get the feedback as to where you may have come up short where you need to be improved, and that has to be properly done so that you can make the necessary changes and the necessary improvements. That is a standard that is applied that I think to all, um, you know, boards of examinations and so forth. They give you back a feedback at least to let you know where you went wrong, where you could have improved, and you determine that. So I think that that needs to be um, looked, at, um, looked at as well. So I'm hoping you're not doing an exam and then somebody come and give you a result and then you say, so where I fall down and you can't hear where you fall down. Where can I improve? You are not told that. Can I see my exam paper? I don't know what is the form, but I'm hoping that it's an open, transparent system so that you can say, well, I went to do the exam. I got 10 out of 20. They said that I failed. I saw my 10 out of 20 that I put there and I fell down in this part aspect of policing, and I need to go back and study it a little bit harder, improve myself, and be able to present myself for the exam once again. That is how it works, at least in medicine, and I'm hoping that it works um, for you um, as well. All right, so um, any more questions? I know there are a lot, right? But I look forward to interacting with you all um, much, much more. But I, I think, uh, yes, yeah, let me start. Right. Um, yes, go ahead, Sergeant. And then, what department you work in? I would like to hear from the traffic warden. So I hear from, this is the first woman officer asking, and then I'll hear from the traffic warden. And somebody represented the, the, um, the civilians, all right? Okay. Yes, go ahead. So we'll hear from three more that represent the wider body. Go ahead. So, in reference to the police app, is there any plan to review the police app as you mean to the high command? Because you went forward, that's one thing that I would like you to revisit. From the 1st July 2019, 
I was presented with a promotion as acting sergeant. As acting sergeant. And at this present time, three years have passed and I'm still acting. You have been acting for how long? Three years. Over three years. Wow. So I'm asking you also to pass PDA. PDA is the appraisal that enables to assess officers and I have had two past PDA. And I'm still acting. So that is one thing I would like also like you to address. Even put it as one of your first priorities. <laughs> I'm a sergeant again, I mean, she's my sergeant, I live in St. Peter's. I will be acting for three years. So basically, at this time, when you retire, no gratuity? Okay. And, and that's, a, that's the same for all? Okay. Well, I will tell you... Um, we recognize that this was a problem across the country. You have people working at the, at, the, um, at the factories at Paul Southwell Industrial Site, and you had people working in the hotel industry, and when they finished their years of work, they were going home with, with nothing. And we, there was an introduction where they introduced the long service gratuity that we applied. Some of them took advantage of it. But the thrust is, and we look closely at it as well, is that after many years of working and dedicating yourself, you should be able to carry home something. That was our policy position. And that is why we started among that group, because that group was, in terms of the hotel industries, very seasonal. And in terms of the factories, we know that most people there were working for minimum wage. And a lot of them, when they retired, they retired into poverty. And then we, th we, th we thought that we should not have allow our workers to retire in poverty. And so we sought to create the long service gratuity so that they can carry home something for all the years of hard work and dedication. And so that is a really our thrust and that will be looked at. I know it is called the non-established workers. Um, I don't know what that means in a greater sense, but it has a legal definition. I'm not talking to the legal definition. I am talking to if somebody is working, then that person is working. And we should seek to really um, deal with their conditions of work and seek as much as possible to really help them. I would say that this is a labor party. This is a workers' party. It is the oldest party in the English-speaking Caribbean. It was founded on the principle that workers should be taken care of. And therefore, that will be the thrust of this government to see where there might be injustices we are going to strengthen our workers' rights. And for those who say giving workers their rights is really um, bad for business, I will tell them to look at the most developed countries in the world. They have the strongest work-related laws, or workers' protection laws, and they have the strongest economies. So it seems to me that when you take care of workers, they work harder and produce more. So, so I, I think that might be um, really need to be, that needs to be looked at as a matter of people's orientation. But I'm very concerned that the non-established workers aren't given their acts to work as hard as 
others and sometimes harder. I want to add also that I met some of the traffic wardens who were on the PEP and training people to become their bosses. I don't understand that. That to me also is an injustice that must be corrected. How can you have somebody in the, the way the white and black, correct? And then somebody come to work with them for the PEP worker to train them to become more established or more permanent and then become their bosses. It is actually against natural justice to do that. You cannot ask a human being to train another human being to really be their superior in terms of the structure of, 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 of you know, leadership in the workplace. And so it is wrong and nobody should be subjected to that. And therefore that is something also that I know the traffic wardens are being faced with and should be looked at and be looked at immediately. I will tell you what I will look at immediately. I want to meet with the Welfare Commission. I want to look at the honorarium. Huh? You have no welfare? Oh, I thought that is what you mentioned. But you have, you have a, 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 a committee or organization within the force? That is not so. Yeah? Huh? Okay, so I am here that officially there is a welfare association. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, knew, I knew that there was one, but that is something that can be given the opportunity to really bring your issues forward, and I would like to hear you as to see what is your issues, of course, as well. All right, so we will look, look at that. Hear yeah, your voice big enough. Good morning. Yes. And as a civilian and a former officer, I was enjoyed the benefits of some of the stuff, medical stuff. Yes. But as a civilian, we are not entitled to dental health, we do not get eye health, we don't get a lot of things that the officers yeah. no longer get. So the, 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 the civilian workers, we don't get a lot of things. And I think that I work in the telecom department, where we have to look at these cameras day in day out. It's not easy on our eyes. And many of us in that department um, seek eye health, eye care, but it's not available to us, so we have to pocket it ourselves. So I think that as a civilian, I'm not sure about the rest departments, but to about my department, that we should be entitled to some health care. We don't have a risk pay, so we don't have an addition to us. So I think that if we best the limiters, 85% of the way, because we are civilians and we should understand a bit of stuff. But I think we are entitled to some medical benefits, but we don't have that Thank as you. civilians. Mm -hmm. Right. Um. Right. Yeah, repeat. I'll give you the last. Go ahead. Right. Right. Number one, four, four. Constable Duncan. So I will just read what I have. Sure. So I have a situation that is very disturbing to me. It's even now affecting my mental. Late last year, a notice was sent out for persons to apply for, for promotion in the rank of corporal of police. I applied and went through the interview process. From reliable sources, from reliable sources, I know that seven of us passed the interview process and only four were promoted, leaving three of us so, the three of us who were not promoted did better than some of those who were promoted. Uh, All right, I would say, I would say, officer, um, um, you, so you have reliable sources, you said? Yes, but, but, I, but I take the gist of your question that there was some inconsistency in, in that. Okay. I just don't, because you say reliable sources, right? <laughs> Why 
I and the others who were not promoted, I was told we had something to do with vaccination. Wait, 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 wait. That was an official answer? Yes, sir. That somebody told you yes. that because you were not vaccinated, you could not be promoted? Yes, sir. So, so let, let me ask, that, that's, a, that's a serious matter. You were told that by a high official? Yes, sir. And actually, sir, I was against taking the vaccine all along. And they told me that my name was on the list to be promoted, but I have to be vaccinated. So, so, so it's an official position of national security that if you are in written, that if you not, are not vaccinated, you cannot be promoted? That's what I was told, sir. You that, was that given to you in writing? No. I was told that. By a high ranking officer, sir. With respect to to the policy position on vaccination, I will give the PS a chance to respond to that. Um, <laughs> and the PS, um, Mr. Petty. All right, all right. Um, Let's, let's calm down. So, um, that is, well, I'll, 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 I'll give him a chance to respond, and I will look at the official policy position with respect to the Ministry of National Security as far as mandatory, mandatory vaccination is concerned. Let me tell you my position. I'm a doctor, and I understand, but I have no problem with, with vaccination. We all know, know that. But, you know, I was also on the fight of protecting people's rights. But if there was a policy position, that was a policy position of a previous government, so the PS or whoever might have been following a direction. So I would like to see that policy position um, if you were told that by a high-ranking police officer, because this cannot be a position by word of mouth. This is really can, you know, borderline type of human rights violation, and those have to be taken very seriously. So those have to be put in firm policy so that you can be satisfied that this is the direction even if you agree or disagree. So I would give him an opportunity to respond and hope that a policy position with respect to your situation will be presented to me and not just word of mouth. I will say that. Um, the other officer spoke about health care. I want you to know that part of us, we will introduce universal health care. Um, even if you're not in government or you know you just do your own thing, that you will be given the opportunity to also have health care as well. All of our people, all workers really should be looked after. That is the thrust of our government going forward. So I want you to know that your welfare is our concern and the welfare of all our citizens. Our citizens should have access to health. They should have access to education. 
and they should have access to a peaceful society and given the opportunity to pursue their own happiness. And that is why the only thing I'm telling, I would say the foundation of all of that is the rule of law. None of this is possible without the rule of law. If you study any constitution, and I had the opportunity to listen to a retiring Supreme Court judge from the United States, and he's a scholar on the rule of law. And I studied him, and I listened him carefully. And I went and did my research, and it is exactly the truth. If there is no rule of law, there is no democratic society, and all of the benefits that we talk about that people enjoy in democracies would not be had. And that is why you who are the enforcers of the law are so important for the establishment, not only the establishment, but the maintenance and the advancement and improvement of the democracy. So if your situation is dire, the democracy might be tethering on borderline on becoming other than a democracy. Believe me, when there's a breakdown of the rule of law, everything that we dream for, hope for, is lost. Therefore, that is why we have to take the law and order very, very seriously in all aspects. Not just to be out there aggressive with people, but we must also look out for the welfare of people and make sure that the laws are just. Because if the laws are not just, people will be affected negatively and the society on a whole will be affected. So I'll give the peers a chance to answer. So to answer your question, we make sure that people get help. Even I do not know established workers have access to health care. Those are the PEP. I do not have access to health care. But you can't have people out there working and they don't have health insurance, especially in the jobs that some of them do. If they cut themselves, you might give them workplace um, compensation or you might give them some social security. But they don't have any health care to take care of themselves. Those things are for me, things that must be corrected so that people can have the opportunity to enjoy think it's and it. So I'll give the chance to, to the peers. Honorable <coughs> Prime Minister, there is there is or was no policy about vaccination. Um, the, rule, the, the procedure for approvals for promotion is that the final approval comes from the Prime Minister, the Minister of National Security. And it was the decision of the then Prime Minister that persons of emotion should be vaccinated. So there is no written policy. There was no written policy and there is none. It was simply a decision of the Prime Minister of the day. And so I would have passed on that information to the Commissioner of Police. And it's not just for corporals. It was for anybody who was to be promoted and was not vaccinated, he did not get approval. So if I may say there is no policy in place. Um, just to comment on the traffic warden, as far as I know, the traffic warden is on the government medical insurance. Um, as is the people from Telecom. What I don't know is that the, she's saying they don't get anything for ICE, so I don't know that. That needs to be checked out. But they will all be on the government medical insurance. Whether there's a restriction on what they get for, then that needs to be looked at. Thank you. So, as I said, I would gather more information um, to some of these questions and get the, the proper basis um, for them. And that is why I think it was wise to give the, um, the PS an opportunity to really respond to it, as I would have asked, and he gave um, his answer. 
And I would simply say there is no written policy, and if there was one, I would change it. And I would say that vaccination status is no longer, and I say no, is no longer a basis for promotion. All right, that is totally separate and apart as to whether or not you should take the vaccine or not. But whatever your choice is, and I would encourage that you get information to make your choice, to be educated and you make an educated choice. What we have realized with the COVID-19 is that some errors were made, and we have to admit them. Well, scientists at one point thought one thing was totally right. In time, they realized we might have made mistakes. If anybody th thought or continue to think that all the decisions made were good decisions, that's arrogance, and that's a bad position to take. But I would say at this time that no longer that should. So if that was part of the criteria, these three officers would have suffered. I will get the information that you'll be looked at with that taken totally off the table and give you a new opportunity to determine by the process whether you should be promoted or not. So I will guarantee you to be looked at without the, the, um, the criterion of vaccination status. So I will say that to you and the others. But again, I will gather the information as to, as to that situation. All right? So you'll get a second opportunity to be looked at. Anybody who would have been discriminated against because of your vaccination status, I will quickly ask that that be, it was not a written policy, so since it was word of mouth, I will give my word of mouth policy. It is not <laughs> accepted, right? And therefore, I, you know, this is an organization that is disciplined, and I understand how um, forces work. You all respond to your superiors and take their orders. So they have taken the orders, and I understand that, and that is why I'm giving them a new order that this not be considered. All right? Okay, then, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Prime Minister. I think that brings us to the end of this, this session, this question and answer session. I think it was a, a productive session, and all that transpired during this session would have been encapsulated in his original speech. I made some notes during his speech and some key phases that jumped out at me that covered everything that came up in the question sessions were adequately resourced. The force must be adequately resourced going forward in order for it to achieve its objectives. The force should be given optimal support. And I, I, I take this from, from, from the authorities. Uh, the force is deserving of respect and there should be improvement in your condition of work. These are all phases from his speech, and I think they adequately covers, covered what would have been raised in the, in the, in the question and answer sessions. Such things such as training, uh, incentives, improved conditions, all encapsulated in the Prime Minister's speech. So we can look forward to a very, a very productive term, uh, of this, this first term of the, the Prime Minister, and we should see some real improvement uh, and professionalization of the organization going forward. I want to thank everyone who would, have, who would have participated in this session, and we will move on with the program, and we will inv invite Superintendent Mills to lead us in some more songs. Uh, I think, well, I'm told one, uh, this would take our spirit to a different, a higher level. Can we just stand at this time? We just have one closing chorus. At this time, as we listened, we can hear that there are issues, that there are burdens coming from all around the room. Nothing that is new to us, but we heard them coming out. And so I think an appropriate chorus would be, um, he giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labor increases. 
Through our afflictions, he adds his mercies. Through multiplied trials, he multiplies peace. His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundaries known no to man. Oh, out of his in finite riches in Jesus he giveth and he giveth and he giveth again be assured that the grace of God it is enough to conquer any storm. Thank you very much. Thank you, Superintendent. Thank you, Superintendent. Be seated. Uh, we'll now, as we wind down this morning's proceedings, I would ask, I would call on Sergeant Marvin Thompson to give us the vote of thanks. Good morning all. Mr. Prime Minister, I beg your leave to adapt the protocol that was so ably established earlier. First, I want to thank Almighty God for allowing us to be here and for the discussion that was had and the words that we got from the Prime Minister. We'd like to thank Inspector Grio for bringing the invocation on these proceedings. A well needed invocation as we embark on a new endeavor with a new Minister of National Security. I want to thank Master Ceremony Superintendent Henry for so ably chairing the proceedings thus far and Superintendent Mills for inputting that necessary piece of God in the praise and worship songs as well as for introducing our keynote speaker this morning. I want to give um, a special thank you to the PM for gracing us with his presence this morning and for the words of encouragement that he has said this morning. I am grateful for the pledge that he made to do all that he can to ensure that police officers and our welfare are looked after as we continue to be professional and dedicated in the completion of our duties. There was a quote I saw that says, thankfulness begins with gratitude. Gratitude is the completion of thankfulness. But there's one that also says, as we express our gratitude, we must not forget that the highest form of appreciation is not merely to utter words, but to live by them. So again, I say thank you to all who are gathered here, those officers who put forth the questions that are necessary, the important issues that we are facing, to the PM this morning, and to all of us who are gathered here for this thing, for <coughs> Commissioner Brandy for his brief remarks, <laughs> and for, for his continued service to us as the lead in the police organization. Thank you again.
And I must say thank you to Sergeant Thompson for his vote of thanks. As we now depart, we would invite Inspector Greer, as he opened us, to close us in prayer. Inspector Greer. Reverend Salomon, dear Lord Jesus, we want to thank you for this very important meeting. We want to thank you, God, for having our new Prime Minister here with us to articulate his position on national security and his plans. And we pray, O oh God, that we as an organization will develop policies and implement them so that we can better provide the service needed to our federation and the citizens and visitors alike. God, we ask that you'll take us to our, our destination as we leave this place and continue to cover us with your blood and the appointed angels to continue to take care of us as we continue to take care of this, our beloved federation. Amen and amen. Thank you. Could we remain standing for the departure of the Honorable Prime Minister and his contingent?